you been to Mississippi before? Oh, many times. Yeah. Many, many times. What I stayed here for a good summer, actually, in, ja in Jackson. Uh, let's say maybe old three. No, it must have been, no, no. So, let's say, oh, like 1999-2000. Why? Wow. Yeah, I spent the summer here. I have a very, very good friend who has a home over here. That's awesome. Yeah, I've been in the areas of my age, too, so. Were you held at gunpoint? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Right, what is your take on the crackdown in Iran? Well, I think that the uprising and the, the revolution that's sort of behind it is far from over. I mean, I think that although the numbers have diminished on the ground uh, as a result of the brutality of the, the crackdown of the protesters, uh, that the same sentiments that led to the uprising in the first place have probably even grown. Uh, and in fact, part of the, uh, the consequences of the crackdown is that even those people who may not have joined the, the protests earlier or who may have disagreed with it um, after seeing you know the videos that everybody else has, saw, has seen that they uh, are now even much more likely to to be against uh, Ahmadinejad and against the, the Revolutionary Guard um, even if they're not really going out onto the streets to protest so I think that this is far from over in many ways and I don't think that they have the same philosophy at all um, in many ways, they are exact opposites, not just in their uh, view of domestic policy, but also with regard to foreign policy. Um, I think that people who say those kinds of things probably mean that they have the same view with regard to Iran's nuclear program. But that's because everybody has the same view with regard to nuclear to Iran's nuclear program. Uh, Iran's civilian nuclear capabilities is a fait accompli. That's it. There's nothing more to talk about. Iran is going to have a nuclear program. Uh, it, it very likely will not have a weapons program. But insofar as there being a difference between the way that Mousavi or that Ahmadinejad thinks of that one issue, then no, there isn't any any difference between them. I think in many, many other ways that they're almost opposites in, in the way that they think about Iran's role in the world and the way that they understand um, the, the uh, importance of, of Iran opening up to the international community. Uh, no, in, in many ways they are they are quite different. Yeah, I mean Ahmadinejad has an enormous amount of support, primarily amongst the rural poor and the villages uh, outside the major cities, and and I would say mostly with the older uh, generation. And Musabi's support tends to be primarily in the cities, especially Tehran. Uh, I mean, you have to understand there's 70 million Iranians. And almost a third of them, I think, live in Tehran alone. I mean, it's a big city. And primarily amongst the youth, the youth make up about 70% uh, of the population. 70% under the age of 30, and about 50% under the age of 24. Uh, so the demographic shifts certainly favor uh, a Musavi candidacy. Uh, the truth is, is that, you know, it wouldn't have been inconceivable for Ahmadinejad to have won this election. It would have been inconceivable for him to win by two to one. Yeah, no question about that. Women have always been at the forefront of all the social and legal issues in Iran. Uh, the thing that people don't understand is that the uh, female education levels and participation levels in civil society in Iran uh, during the Islamic Republic, you know, under the, the mullahs, is actually far, far higher than it was under, you know, the secular leadership of the Shah. Women in Iran now enjoy about a 90% literacy rate, uh, and about 60% of all college degrees go to women. Uh, and it by far has the most dynamic women's rights movement in the entire Muslim world, not just in the Middle East. So it's not unusual, it may be for some, to see women out on the streets, but for Iranians or people who observe Iran, this is pretty standard for us. You know, it's totally normal to see women at the, at the forefront. To be perfectly honest, this is sort of the result of a miscalculation on the part of the mullahs. 
Uh, during the Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s, uh, so this was, you know, six months after the revolution, basically, uh, because all the men were out in, in the front lines, uh, the Islamic Republic really encouraged women to go to school, get degrees, get educations, get into the workforce. Um, and that war lasted almost a decade. And when it was over, what the Republic had in, on its hands was this huge core of very well-educated, uh, very well-experienced women who weren't about to go back home at this point. Um, and they've, in a way, had to be, had to deal with the, the consequences of that. I think it's, it's a mischaracterization to refer to Iran as theocracy. Iran actually has a very sophisticated constitution. Uh, it has usually the freest and fairest elections in, in the entire Middle East. Uh, this is a very new experience for Iranians, which is why you saw the uprising that you did, because elections aren't normally stolen in Iran. I mean, yes, there's corruption. Yes, there's graft. There's corruption and graft in our election process, but nothing like this. Um, you have a separation of powers, a, a freely elected parliament, a fairly independent judiciary. Iran is actually, in many ways, a democracy. It's just a really bad one. What we have in Iran is an authoritarian state. Maybe even at this point a police state, but not a theocratic state. Uh, in fact, uh, the current crisis right now is not about you know the secularists versus the mullahs or you know the, the kids versus the theocrats. Uh, many of the mullahs themselves, in fact, some high-ranking mullahs, the highest, uh, the Grand Ayatollahs Montezeri and the Grand Ayatollah Sanai, who are the two highest religious figures in all of Shia Islam, not just in Iran, uh, have thrown in their lot with the reformists. Um, as has Ayatollah Rafsanjani, that's probably the second most powerful man in Iran. Uh, so even the mullahs themselves have kind of split between those who support the reformers and those who don't. Um, the question right now is much more about uh, the military establishment in Iran. Where, where is sort of the, the military security apparatus in all of this? Uh, that, that Ahmadinejad really represents. And for most Iranians, what they think is happening in Iran is nothing short of a military coup, uh, which is why you see all these strange coalitions forming. This is about the very nature of the state itself at this point. It's not even about an election anymore. So in that regard, what I find really fascinating is that even under the extreme limitations that have been placed on Iranians, they have nevertheless still managed to pour out onto the streets and make themselves heard. I had somebody yesterday in New Orleans say, didn't we have an election stolen in 2000? What did we do? Uh, and he's right. I mean, you know, there is there is this sort of idea that when you have the kinds of freedoms that we have here in the United States, we we it tends to well, let's just say it softens you up a little bit. <laughs> so maybe that's what we can learn from from Iran is that you know let's let's not take our our freedoms for granted.